You've just woken up to find Britain has been abandoned and everyone left behind is infected with a mind-breaking virus. They only have one goal, and that is to infect and kill anyone still alive. What do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the rage virus in 28 days later. These animal rights activists have just broken into a research facility to rescue chimpanzees, but they're all about to destroy the human race. This scientist warns them that these animals shouldn't be let out because they've been infected with a highly contagious virus. But the woman releases the chimp and gets bitten. The virus begins to take over and she starts spewing blood over everything, including her fellow activists. All right, whatever this virus is, it's worse than anything humanity has ever seen. It took only 15 seconds for her to go from animal lover to straight up animal, and it spreads just as quickly. But this isn't even the biggest problem here. This is a maximum containment level four facility because it holds dangerous pathogens like smallpox, avian influenza virus, and Russian spring summer encephalitis. A place with this much security risk should never have only one researcher in the building in the middle of the night with no safety protocols for a contagion lockdown. Now, activists aren't always the most logical people in the world either. Historically, bad decisions are made when passionate people don't use their brains. And breaking into this place because you feel sad for Mr. Monkey here is soon going to affect every human on the planet. 28 days later, Jen the bike courier wakes up in a hospital, and things seem to be a little out of place. There's no hospital staff or patients anywhere. In fact, the whole building is completely abandoned. This is seriously concerning. He tries the phone looking for a signal, and none of them are working. With no one to talk to, he grabs a bag and starts scavenging. Okay, this guy's already thinking about survival. If I woke up in an empty hospital, even the world's worst hangover isn't going to explain this. And going into full-on survival mode is the right decision. Instead of trying to find out what happened, we should assume the worst and start grabbing supplies to prepare for the unknown. Now, Pepsi is delicious, but ultimately not going to help you survive. The brain's hunger regulation system in the hypothalamus doesn't really register liquid calories. And going three to four weeks without food, only to break the fast of caffeine and sugar could severely affect your blood levels and put your system into shock. Food deprivation changes the way your body metabolizes nutrients. And when food is reintroduced, there's an abrupt shift that shocks the body's system called refeeding syndrome, which makes you feel weak, inflicts seizures, and even causes heart failure. David Blaine experienced this when he famously went without food for 44 days in a glass box over London. And they learned that refeeding him too quickly was actually more dangerous than the stunt itself. This guy's really skinny and hasn't eaten in 28 days, so we need to replace these lost electrolytes quickly or he's in trouble. On his own, his best option would be to find electrolytes from powder packets or coconut water and drink them for a few days as he slowly reintroduces solid foods into his diet. Exploring the city, he discovers that everyone in Britain has fled the country from an emergency that was so dire, soldiers have been ordered to shoot to kill. He also finds messages left behind by those who fled, and a few of the messages mention some sort of infection. All oh, right, there's no doubt some serious shit went down, and it's tempting to go back home, but don't. As far as we know, there's only one safe place in the city, and that's the hospital. The fact that we were left there with no incident for 28 days tells me it's safe to use as a base until we learn more. It has multiple wings and rooms on the inside, so if there was a threat, we can navigate into safer subsections of the building to protect ourselves. It also gives us a good vantage point to safely observe the city during both the day and the night. Just because the streets are empty doesn't necessarily mean nobody's here. I would wait in the hospital for two to three more days before going out again to see if there are others around. The man explores a church and finds a mass of dead bodies. He calls out and sees the first signs of life, but it's not reassuring. Something is wrong with these guys. In the hallway, a priest starts running towards him and he knocks the devil out of him. He runs away, drawing the attention of the others. They chase him into the street where the man is rescued by two survivors who deal with the problem in the most efficient way they can think of, by blowing up a gas station. Whoever's done this is an idiot. The noise from the explosion might draw more attention and put our lives at greater risk. I'd be thankful for their help, but saving my life doesn't mean you've earned my trust. Now this is some kind of apocalypse, gas is an extremely valuable resource. Fuel has a lot of applications, whether as a weapon or as an energy supply for vehicles, generators, and powered equipment, all vital for the rebuilding of civilization. The UK has over 8,000 gas stations, which is world leading, and London alone has nearly 1,000 of them. But when all the infrastructure has collapsed, every one of these stations needs to be considered a resource to protect and defend. They take him down into a subway and hide out in the convenience store, where Mark and Selena here tell him the bad news. A bloodborne virus started spreading in the country before quickly overtaking the cities, and now it has killed practically everyone. There's no more government, military, radio broadcasts, or even power. Now that's a pretty horrifying takeaway, and it means there's no help coming. He realizes this group is his best chance at survival and asks them to help him find his family in Deadford. The two survivors agree to take him so long as he follows their two rules. Don't go outside alone and only travel during the day. For a list of rules to survive the apocalypse, this is really disappointing. If I was going to bring someone into my group, I'm giving that person a longer list. 
Rule number one, you need to find more clothing to cover as much skin as possible to prevent infection. More skin means more exposure to the virus. And if you get infected easily, then you're an unacceptable risk to the group. So that hospital gown is not meeting my apocalyptic dress code. Rule number two, cover all your holes. Your face has the most pathways into the body. So if you can't get fancy gas masks like these two, then find a motorcycle helmet to protect your face. Rule number three, be physically and mentally fit to contribute. This scar on his half-shaved head tells me he might have had brain surgery. And if he has bad coordination as a result, he can't defend anyone. So I'm testing his reflexes and situational awareness beforehand. Rule number four, learn quickly. This guy is inexperienced, and this is the worst place to learn on the job. So a crash course in finding the infected is necessary before going back outside. Ultimately, 80% of these scenarios are best survived with precaution and planning, and I wouldn't hit the road until all these are addressed. The next day, they walk to the man's house, and he's horrified to find his parents have killed themselves. He finds a note in their hands saying they left him asleep in the hospital on purpose, and he's devastated. The group decides to stay the night and go back to the shop in the morning but they didn't take enough precautions here because suddenly they get attacked by the infected neighbors. The survivors kill him quickly, but the other man has been bitten. With no remorse, Selena here hacks him to death before he can turn and rushes to leave, before more infected arrive. Okay, this woman is an absolute badass. She had zero hesitation in killing her friend, but it's not as easy as it looks. Now, murder isn't something you pick up as a pastime activity, but if you want to survive, you'll need to be prepared to commit to some terrible things for the sake of survival. However, since this virus spreads through blood, hacking someone up and flinging their fluids everywhere is the worst possible thing to do. We need to consider getting ranged weapons that deal with these infected. So far, we've seen a lot of shops that are left fully stocked and intact, so I would be looking for local gun shops that I could raid to keep us safer from a distance. Police stations would be even better, as they would not only have guns and ammo, but also ride shields and more protective gear for any future attacks. They begin walking back into the city, but already this seems poorly thought out. We haven't seen any cars around, and yet there's one parked right here at the house. If I have a choice between walking outside with the infected or driving over them in a car, you better believe I'm looking for those keys. As they go back to the subway, they see lights in an apartment start to flash. They enter the building and climb the staircase to find it, but they have to take a break when Jim here has a sugar crash. The woman offers him some painkillers and soda, but the infected arrive. They race up the stairs to the top floor, where a guy in ride gear shows up and offers to help them. He fights off the infected and they escape into the apartment. Just like fuel, people are a rare and valuable resource too, but they're also dangerous and will try to use each other to survive. These guys saved our lives, but it's because they need something in return. And before helping them, I'm considering what I think they can contribute to our collective survival before making any promises. A larger group isn't necessarily safer. More people traveling together means more noise, more food and water required, which means more scavenging, which means more danger. It's cold-blooded, but I thank them with a care package of food and water and leave them to their fate. The next day, the courier Jim is shown to the roof, where he discovers the father has a water problem. All the tanks are empty, the solar still isn't working, and it hasn't rained in weeks. They'll dehydrate if they stay here any longer. An urban environment is the worst place to get food and water sustainably, so long-term survival depends on moving out of the city and looking for better places to settle. Now, water is a great protection from the affected because they can't swim. Luckily, London has the River Thames running through it, which is considered one of the cleanest rivers in all of Europe. If you could get a tugboat, catch, or a trawler, you could sail the Thames from Lechley to the South End without having to worry about the infected. The Thames is also home to cod, herrings, and bass, so fishing would be a sustainable way to get nutrient-rich food without having to go into the city to scavenge. Later that day, they hear a radio recording being broadcasted by soldiers stationed in Manchester who claim they have an answer to the infection. The father proposes they all go out there to find them, as they can't survive here any longer. They head up to Manchester in a taxi loaded with supplies, and the road takes them through this dark tunnel where inside is a huge blockade of cars. Instead of backing out, he drives straight up and over it. They manage to get all the way across, but the car hits the ground hard and gets a flat tire. Then these rats start crawling around them, and they realize the critters are running away from the infected, and they're closing in. They change the tire as quickly as they can, narrowly driving out of the infected's reach and escaping with their lives. Okay, if you have one of the few working cars in the entirety of London and you drive it over a heaping pile of other cars, your driving privileges are hereby revoked and I'm kicking you out of the f***ing car. We can change the tire, but the problem is, about 60% of people don't actually know how. If no one in the car knows anything about mechanics, maybe we should stay on the roads and take the scenic route. The group arrives at a well-stocked supermarket and go on a shopping spree, taking everything they need for the long haul, from foodstuffs, chocolates, a bottle of whiskey, and apples. They even offer to pay. Okay, they're having a good time, and that's important. We can't always be serious, but also, who's gonna tell us to eat our veggies if everyone's moms are dead? Instead of all teasers and Pepsi, this is what we should be getting. Water is an obvious must, and vitamin water is even better. When it comes to food, however, we need to be more selective. First, I'd pack beans. This may be the single most plentiful resource for protein that we can get. The only problem is they have to be cooked, so I'd also look for dehydrated meats. They have a long shelf life and give us protein we can eat on the go. 
Partak is also useful. This stuff lasts for years and provides a huge amount of food energy in a very small package. In the American Civil War, it was fed to both sides precisely because this much alone can give you as much as 100 kilocalories, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're rationing food, it makes a huge difference. Unfortunately, it tastes like shit. So I'm also grabbing honey, not just because it's a sweetener, but because it literally does not expire and it's great for healing burns and wounds. And that leaves me with the last item on my list, vodka. It's a great sterilizing agent when you're in an emergency. It can make all the difference for both your birthday party and your partly severed leg. They stop the siphon petrol from a tanker truck, but Jim here goes sneaking to the nearby diner alone, breaking 50% of the rules for survival in the process. Inside, he finds a bunch of dead bodies and an infected kid who he then beats to death. After getting a jerry can filled, they continue the drive to Manchester. They have a rest in the countryside and set up camp, but that night they have trouble sleeping and find out that Selena here was a pharmacist who's got a lot of drugs. She hands them some sleeping pills and I'm already thinking this collection of meds is going to be really useful. Now, medication can be a valuable resource. Even if we don't need all of it, they make for a good resource to bargain with if we ever encounter other people and need their help. But it also makes you more cautious around this woman. She didn't tell anyone she had them until now. There hasn't been any reason yet to be suspicious of her. But when the situation gets more serious and disagreements develop, drugging people is an easy and subversive way to take care of problems without conflict. I'd be careful to stay on her good side. They continue their way, but arrive to find that the city of Manchester is burning and there's no one waiting at the blockade. The father goes looking for some soldiers and this is the last thing he'll ever do. As a drop of infected blood falls in his eyes and he contracts the virus. He starts to turn and Jim here steps up to finish him, but suddenly the father gets shot to death by soldiers that come out of hiding. They take the group back to their base and welcome them in. They quickly realize these people are even more prepared for the end of days than the Roman Catholic Church. They've got a security system of walls, generators, floodlights, landmines, and a kitchen that's fully stocked. It's clear if there's any chance to survive comfortably, it's going to be here. But now we have to deal with another danger, people. Jim here discovers they've also got a dark secret, as the Major shows him an infected soldier being kept prisoner. They're testing to see if the infected can starve to death. Okay, this is dangerous, but it's also necessary. These people have enough security and manpower to start considering how to rebuild society and studying the infected is important in achieving this goal. Now, a real enemy is not actually the infected, it's the infection itself. Viruses are living organisms and all organisms are evolutionarily designed for survival. So their actions will tell us what it needs to stay alive. The virus relies on its host to help it spread to other people before the host dies. So if we quarantine the human race away from the virus until all the hosts die, it's technically a solution. But anyone that lived through 2020 knows this isn't a practical one. These guys have a lot of gear, and if they had access to a microscope, I'd want to take samples of blood to test what the virus might be vulnerable to. Fire might kill it, but how much, and at what temperature? How long does it live without a host, and can it be killed with other chemicals? We won't know until we study it. Then if they had any GPS devices, I'd set it free 10 kilometers away from the compound and track its movements every hour. This gives us an excellent data set that might reveal more about how to kill them. We could discover they're more inactive during the day, or that they never cross water. And if we track more than one, we might learn they gather in specific areas or migrate based on certain factors. Ultimately, information is king to beam this thing, and we shouldn't ignore its importance. That night, the infected start running for the building, and the soldiers go full combat mode, emptying their guns to all the infected. These guys take out everyone without even blinking an eye. It seems this is the safest place in the whole country, until one of the soldiers gets handsy with Selena here, and Jim rushes to defend her, but he's overpowered, until the sergeant steps in and knocks some sense into the soldier. In private, the major reveals he set up the radio broadcast as a way to lure in women for his soldiers and use them to repopulate the earth. Jim runs to warn them and make an escape, but they're stopped by the soldiers. Then the major gives them one last chance to join, but he refuses and they're not gonna let him stand in their way. Okay, we have to be more strategic than this. Running around the mansion and announcing your escape is not going to help. We need to play this under the radar and buy ourselves time to make a better plan. When you're forced to choose between death or a bad night of social interaction, the choice is pretty clear. I know it's harsh, but we have to make a lot of difficult decisions for the sake of survival. I'd pretend to support his plan, but try to convince the major to let the women settle in first and cook for the soldiers. These guys can't even make eggs right, so I'm sure they'd agree. This would give us the opportunity to use her bag full of Valium and slip it into everyone's food. It won't knock them out, but if they drink a lot of alcohol with it, their heart rates will slow, they'll become subdued, and they might even lose control of their coordination and mobility, and we have a much better chance at escape. The next day, they're brought onto the forest to be executed. But first, this soldier wants to have a little fun before getting down to business. The sergeant gets shot by one of the soldiers, and the other soldier gets mad. But with their backs turned, Jim takes his only chance to escape. They go looking for him, but have no idea he's hiding among the dead bodies, and escapes over the wall to safety. Running through the forest, he collapses and sees a plane in the sky. There might still be hope for them yet, but first, he has to save the girls. Back at the mansion, the women are told to dress up for the soldiers, but Selena here convincingly asks to change in privacy. Taking the opportunity, she gives the girls drugs so she won't care what happens next, and by the time the soldier runs in, she's already taken them. 
That's when they hear an alarm blare from the blockade, as Jim here lures them all outside. They drive out in a military jeep to hunt the man down. He ambushes one of them and leaves his body to be found in a truck, which the Major discovers has been sabotaged. The infected start coming, and realizing he's been tricked, he runs back to the mansion. Later that night, Jim arrives back at the manor and sets the infected soldier free from its chains. Inside the building, a few soldiers wait for their comrades and don't see the infected man behind them until it's too late. He breaks through the window and infects the soldier as the women run away. These guys stop them, but when they see the infected man running through the mansion, they split up, with this guy taking the women upstairs. Okay, the infected are now in the house, which makes it the most dangerous place to be. Now this was a great strategy to kill the guards, but now the women are in even more danger. They need a place where the soldiers won't find them and the infected can't access, and that's the guard post on the roof here. It's on an elevated platform that most likely uses a ladder, and once you pull that up, there's no way for the infected to climb it. Let the infected man clear the house and come down once he leaves the compound. The other soldier comes to kill the infected man, but gets blindsided by another and gets eaten. This guy comes out of hiding and runs right into Jim's bayonet. The infected are closing in, and he goes searching for the women before the infected find them first. He sees Selene here being dragged by another soldier and ambushes the man, brutally killing the guy. Jim here goes from 0 to 100 so fast that she thinks he's infected too, until she finally sees him up close. They all reunite and run for the cab parked outside. The girl hops into the driver's seat, but when Jim opens the door, the Major is waiting inside and shoots him. The girl backs the car up into the mansion, when the infected man pulls the Major out the back window. They get back into the car and leave the compound, escaping with their lives. 28 days later, they take shelter in the English countryside, where Jim here has recovered from his bullet wound. When he goes downstairs, the girl comes in and tells them something's coming, and they rush out. They take this giant sheet of cloth out into a field and lay it down, as a plane flies by, seeing their signal for help. But what do you think? How would you be 28 days later? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.